Buenos dias. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 55. But today I want to ask for your help. Can you help me out? Uh, We're going to do an alternating uh, reading. So I will read the first verse, and then you will read the second, and then the third, and I'll do the third, and then you you know. So let let us read together. This text is too rich for me to read it alone, so... In those days, uh, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country. Where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? And blessed is she who believed that there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we come to your word, to your message. We ask that as the words are spoken, uh, that our, our ears may hear. May we listen, may we comprehend. May we receive. Speak, Holy Spirit, for we are all listen, listening. Speak, Holy Spirit, for your servant is listening. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a man, na- a, a, a man, uh, a very good-looking man, good-looking. named Eduardo. Eduardo was a pastor, and as he was writing his sermon, he hit a wall. And the following is what went through this person's mind. Nope, not that. That doesn't make sense. This doesn't connect. I wonder what's for lunch. (laughs) Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 minutes into writing the sermon, and I am still on the first sentence. Then I gave up. Then I told, I, I told God, do it for me. God, just take it and, and redo everything on my sermon. Actually, once now that you're in it, why don't you just rearrange my whole life? Uh, but when you're done re- uh, doing all the editing, you bring it back to me to make sure that it fits in my life. Mm. God is not an editor. God is looking for common, ordinary people like you and me who are willing to be used by the Almighty. God wants to write our story. God doesn't want to be our editor. But we want to write the story. And then we call God in as our editor. When the story gets messy, then we want to turn it over to God so that it can be revised and corrected, clean up the mess, but then we grab the pen back again. I guess our response is not very graceful, but it's territorial. No, God, this is my life. 
this is mine. And this is where uh, there is a contrast in today's scripture. The lives of ordinary people, Elizabeth and Mary. Their fascinating, tumultuous, and ordinary lives. But before we dive in head first, let's start from the beginning. Let's set up the stage. Luke starts by telling us the purpose of the gospel. And as it is customary, it's a message directed to a person, someone named Theophilus, which means God's friends. Are you God's friend? I'm going to try it again. Are you God's friends? Yes. yes. Okay, then this gospel means it's about you. God's friends, this message is for you so that you may know the truth. Immediately we're given names, Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. Zachariah being a priest and Elizabeth being a descendant of Aaron. These two names are important to have in mind because, first off, they are well into their years. They are both ordinary people. And Elizabeth's name is the most beautiful name. It is also my mom's name. But in all seriousness, as I was reading, I thought, I think I've heard this before. Have you read a story that you you thought, I've read this before somewhere? Uh, Especially when you read the New Testament, there are a lot of similarities. Then I remember this has happened before. Zachariah and Elizabeth resemble Elkanah and Hannah. Remember Hannah, Samuel's mom? She couldn't have children. She was barren. And then the Lord remembered her and Hannah was pregnant. What about Abraham and Sarah? Ordinary people. Yet in their old age they had Isaac. Yes, I've heard this before. But now this story has a few different obstacles because Elizabeth is two for two. She's barren like Hannah and old like Sarah. She's about to say, just let me live my life in peace. But in these three examples, we see something that is unwavering, incomprehensible, something profound, and that is that they all had faith. Faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservation. And trust is something we struggle with. One day, while a father and a son were out hiking, climbing around some cliffs, the father hears a voice from above yelling, Hey, Dad! Catch me. The father turns and sees his son joyfully jumping off a rock straight at him. He had jumped and then yelled, Hey, Dad. The father became an instant circus act, catching him. Both fell to the ground. As soon as the dad was able to catch his breath, he said, Eduardo Alberto Carrillo Tonche. (laughs) Yeah, you're in trouble when they do the fall. Can you give me a good reason why, why you did that? He responded with remarkable calmness. Sure, because you're my dad. His whole assurance was based in the fact that his father was trustworthy. He could jump without reservation because his trust exists. Isn't this even more true for a Christian? Another point that Luke makes is that there is a step parallelism between John the Baptist and Jesus. On one hand, there is Elizabeth who is old and barren in that time and place. It was a great humiliation. Yet this humiliation is overcome. In the case of Jesus, there is no barren or old age to overcome, but there is even a deeper personal, social, moral, and economic humiliation. In the context of Mary, a young woman living in a small town, you know about small towns. Everybody knows your business. She knew what it was going to happen when her belly started showing. She knew that women in her context were goods. She would have been considered damaged goods. She was about to wed Joseph and all of a sudden she's pregnant? What? She was, yes, she was visited by a messenger from God. Yes, she understood that she had been chosen, favored by God. Yet, isn't it a strange blessing? I mean, I didn't see Mary being bumped into the social spotlight or brushed elbows with the high society. 
Mary was letting the writer of her life, the creator of her life, to be done with her as God wanted. She didn't want an editor. She gave her life to be written fully, trusting and without reservations. So Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and as soon as Elizabeth hears Mary's voice, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaims loudly, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? That the mother of my Lord comes to me. That's a nice picture. That's a nice greeting. Has anybody been greeted like that? That's very nice. But then, wait a minute. Did Elizabeth forget that she was old and barren? And now she's pregnant? I don't know, but my grandma would have been telling me all about it. Yet Elizabeth is astonished that Mary is there. Elizabeth's pregnancy is a miracle. Yet she understands she is before an even bigger miracle. Mary, the mother of Jesus. She sees the Holy Spirit in Mary, which takes me to today, to our lives. Are we perceptive enough to recognize God's miracles in the world? Or are we blinded by our own miracles? Are we able to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in each other and exclaim loudly, blessed are you, why am I so favored? by your visit. It is essential for us to recognize God in the world. Something essential is something that you cannot do without. It is mandatory. It is important. The presence of God is something that is an absolute necessity to experience God's blessings fully. It is not an optional thing, but it is absolutely essential. There are a few essentials in life. If you are going to make bread, you must have dough. If you're going to fish, you must have bait. If you're going to speak, you need to have vocal cords. If you're going to think, you must have a brain. If you're going to drive, you must have a driver's license. If you're going to make a phone call, you need a phone. If you're going to eat, you must have food. If you're going to have chicken, you must have hot sauce. Yes, sir. <laughs> In Elizabeth's case, it was essential, essential to give praise and honor to God to recognize God's mighty acts, a graceful response from ordinary people. And then we find Mary's response, the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. That is to say, it's not about me. I had nothing to do. It's the Lord. How many times in a day, or better yet, in a week, we say, this is the Lord's doing. I had nothing to do with it. Are we able to recognize God in a broken world? Can we share what God has done in Christ, what God has done in us? Furthermore, do we recognize we also need saving? Because Mary does. She says, my Savior, she is not excluding herself. She's not saying, well, I'm giving birth to the Messiah, so I'm good. No, Mary understands that the child she's going to give birth to is God's son. He's the one Isaiah talks about, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. That's why Mary can't say, this is all about me. That's why we can't say, this is all me. She says, my soul points to God Look at what God is doing in my life. Look at what God has promised. Look at what this child will be. Look at what this lowly servant is carrying. Yes, we know Mary's name. A young, a young pregnant girl engaged to Joseph. An ordinary girl from, with a graceful response. Mary was about to be a mother. There's something about moms. They know more than we think they know. I keep encountering that over and over. It seems like they are our faithful cheerleaders watching, following every step of the game and encouraging their children from the stands. Come on, Johnny, run that ball. 
Mothers see greatness in their children even before we achieve something. And I want to say it is true of Mary as well. She saw her people in oppression. She saw despair. She saw hopelessness. In Mary's eyes, the child she was expecting was hope. She didn't see only the child of God, but a liberator, a counselor, Emmanuel, God with us. But just like many others in that time and today, probably she was wondering, is God for real? Mary was most likely not well educated. She was young, so maybe her mother taught her the basics of faith. In her Magnificat, she not only reassures God's salvation to Israel, but stretches us out for future generations. God's mercy extends from generation to generation. Mary tells of mighty deeds. Has God done mighty deeds in your life? Yes. In your job? Yes. In your family? Yes. I know God is still doing mighty deeds in the world. It is no secret why you are here. It is not by chance that you are where you are, and it is because God steer in your life a longing to know more about God. The creator of our lives, the writer of our lives, wants free range in your life to clean up the mess. God does not want to be an editor. God wants to be the writer of your life. Even when you think you might be old, barren. God wants to do great things in your life. And this is not to boast of ourselves, but to boast of God. Even if that means disapproval of the world, and I don't know about you, but I'm not looking for approval of the world, but of the maker of this world. Not of people, but of the creator of people. Not of those who can, who can kill with words, but from which life everlasting and mercy extends from generation to generation this Christmas season I want to make a personal invitation to everyone to enjoy time with your loved ones to enjoy Christmas breakfast, lunch, dinner opening the gifts but most importantly to remember and be thankful to fill yourself with hope in God incarnate to commit yourself to let God be upon your life and let the Creator write your life. And that you may leap with joy when you recognize God in anyone you meet. God's friends, my soul rejoices in what God is doing in your life. May your response to God's blessings be graceful. Amen. Amen. Closing hymn this morning is hymn number.